Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GT Sessions podcast. And today we have an amazing guest, Mr. Ravi Ray. How are you, Ravi? Andrew, superb, buddy. Really, really well. I'm looking out in my garden, beautiful white snow, so all is good. Beautiful white snow? Hmm. I've had loads of snow here. Really? Where are you then? Epsom. Oh, you see, you're in the posh bit. <laughs> boy, boy from East London did good. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but you should go back to East London, you see, because East London is where all the trendy, you know, the, all the kind of trendy people live now. Uh, well, they're trying. It's, it's because it's uh, the cheapest place in London now to live, East London. It's going through that gentrification. So it's certainly shifting dynamic down there now. Come on, you've got to go to Shoreditch, you know, and then and then roll your roll your trousers up a little bit, you know. So show your socks. <laughs> no, I'm from further east. I'm from originally from Barking and Dagenham. So I'm from the brown belt of Ford manufacturing. I'm gonna say, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Okay. Have you got a Ford a Ford tattoo? I, I have a Ford Fiesta, not a tattoo. Hey, if, you buy, my, uh... if you buy a Ford Fiesta, you've got to, you've got to have a tattoo, you know, you know that. <laughs> you know what, Andrew? I I turned fifty this year. And, no, uh, no, yeah, never. I do. And uh, so uh, we've committed tattoos coming at some point this year. Really? Yeah. We yeah, see, one, been... we see one of my one of my favorite favorite people in the world um, is David Lee Roth. Yeah, the, the the singer from Van Halen. Okay. And um, he has. The I don't know what they call it. It's, 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 it's a, he's got a Japanese tattoo on him. So it's basically when he takes his shirt off, it's like a waistcoat. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's like a body art. Yeah, and he did it when he was sixty. I think he did it when he was sixty years old. Hmm. So there's a chance for us both. You see, we could both be walking around. You see, with our body <laughs> tattoos. You know, singing, singing, singing Panama. Well, maybe not. Maybe <laughs> that later. sounds maybe way later. too painful for me. Okay, maybe later. <laughs> <laughs> Although there was a, a time I remember, we were in Barcelona, the whole family. You reminded me of a uh, uh, of uh, something that happened, and we were walking along the beach, and as you do in Barcelona, and there were a couple of guys walking away, and we're like, "Fine, you know." The kids were like three and five at that time, and the closer and closer we got to these guys, we're like, "Something's not right. Those trunks are very, very tight." And we got closer and closer, and then we realized it was all tattooed. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ooh. they were completely in the nude, and it was all tattooed trunks. So, yeah, and the kids were looking like, hmm. We had some interesting questions so, after so that they, experience. So they, so they said, Daddy, 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 when are you having it, though? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> lovely to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. And, My uh, pleasure. And I suppose it was um, it was quite a few years ago that we met Anna originally, um, mm-hmm. but you know we, we come back to that a bit later in the episode. Um, our, our paths crossed at the, <laughs> at the famous big meatball. But anyway, that's mm. the, the meatball company. Who is the meatball company? Let me tell you: you've got to wear slacks. You've got to wear polo Ralph Lauren shirts. You've got to wear hush puppies. Hush puppies. Yep. <laughs> anyway, so. Just to just to introduce, so Ravi Ray, what gets you up in the morning at the moment? What is what is going on in the Ravster's world? <laughs> what gets up me up in the morning? So, you know what? In the last couple of years, my daughter, so she's studying history at university, and she really wants to get into philosophy. So, but she did history, and she's but she's still very philosophical in her thinking. And she introduced me to Stoicism, the Stoics. Ah, uh, fantastic. <laughs> I've Marcus, got to say, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius. That's the one. Yeah. And, uh, and so I tell you what, a lot of my thinking in the last year has really started becoming a bit more stoic about life. And wow, maybe it's wow, an age wow. thing as well, you know, getting into your mid century, it's that, you know, kids, you know, come September this year, we'll have an empty nest. I don't know how the hell that happened or how quickly that happened. Um, and so, you know, you reflect, you think about loads of stuff. and. Yeah, I think the mornings generally are just starting off with a little bit of gratitude, really, you know, because, you know, you see it right now around the world, you know, with this darn pandemic, just the struggles people have, mm. putting food on the table, you know, security of their home. And, and you think, mm. you know what, Ravi, you got it. Okay. In fact, you got it really, really well. So, yeah, get me up in the morning. It's just thankful. 
quite honestly, where what we have, the kids are in a good place, the business is doing well. And uh, health-wise, yeah, there's ups and downs. But again, think stoically, it's all pretty damn good. You're, um, you're, so look, no. you're looking good, Rafster. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> you, 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 you know, you, you were probably one of the best-looking Indian guys that I know, actually. Which obviously is, is a bit of is a bit of actually a bit of a disappointment for those people listening on Spotify because they're not going to see such what such a good looking guy is. But actually, you know, as I'm I, I, blushing now, as I, as I, yeah, but as I mentioned, you know, you are going to be a future Bollywood star. Yeah, uh, obviously, I I am already a Bollywood star because actually I have got videos on YouTube dancing to Bollywood music, which have got 100, <laughs> over hundred thousand views. But that's another story, but not for this episode. Is this is that through the TikTok channel? No, no, I'm not even on TikTok. It'd be even millions of views if it was on TikTok. Tell uh, you. My, my, my daughter's made me do a few dances with her and on TikTok. One of them's got past half a million. We're like, wow, this is interesting. So it's just us being silly. So, um, one, of my, one of my previous guests, uh, Robert Bruce, uh, down in Australia, he, his, his daughter, because um, we were talking about social media a little bit, he's a, he's a mm. kind of digital marketing kind of guy, he's ex-military. And he was talking about his, his his daughter was would run into their room. Dad, 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 my my videos on TikTok's gone viral. I've got 1.8 million views. I'm wow. going, wow. Yeah. So, so, so Robert says, Can I be on the next video? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was I was gonna sh- I was gonna show I was gonna show the people that are on watching on YouTube this book. Do you know who this mm. is? Mm. It's a very famous yeah. book. So if you if you if you're into stoicism. Yeah, then you must be reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius and also listening to Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday, I can't make a note. So with uh, Aurelius, um, I'm actually reading a book called The 365 Day Stoic. Um, And basically they take excerpts from that book as well as discourses Mm -hmm. and give you a thought for the day. <clears throat> which is pretty cool. It was a nice gift from one of my mates. Um, so I like that one. Yes, yeah, so if you, Ryan Holiday basically wrote the, the well, he wrote, he wrote the Daily, Daily Stoic, which has got the 366 wisdoms, meditations on wisdom, perseverance, art of living, etc. He's done. All that's stuff. the one I'm reading. Okay, yeah. So that's that's written by Ryan Holiday or collated by Ryan Holiday. Got it. Um, also, he's written the Obstacle Is the Way, Life of the Stoics, Trust Me, I'm Lying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's yeah, exactly. That's a good one. That. No, no, so Ryan Holiday, I'd recommend you, if you follow him and anybody who's listening, re- recommend you have a look at that stuff because there's some really good, um, there's some really good uh, research work he's done around stoicism and um, how it applies, how amazingly, even though, the, the, you know, Marx Aurelius was the Roman emperor from many, 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 many years ago, when you read it, you go, wow, this could be this today. Yeah. And it yeah, is it's today. frightening. Because mm-hmm. the, the Marx Aurelius lived through, I think his, I think it was a major, global pandemic for five years um and he was the roman emperor during that term and he had to deal with you know keeping the roman empire together dealing with all that kind of adversity so it's it's, mm. it's it, you know the the parallels to what you know what's happening at the moment is is quite staggering but you know what so so firstly you should be a mastermind there's some really interesting general knowledge you have there andrew i, th- I think wah, uh, wah. <laughs> my final, my final, my final question. <laughs> but you know what? It, I, but there's something in what you say, right? <clears throat> whether it's that many years ago, whether it's the last decade, whether it's today, humans are humans, and how we show up, how, what affects us, what are our let's call them saboteurs, what are our sages? You know, that stuff doesn't change massively no. because our DNA is what makes us the beasts that we are. And so I'm not surprised that, you know, some of that stuff still resonates with people. And I, you know, they've read a cracking book called Yen Zhu, written by China's first ever billionaire. And, you know, you read those passages up, okay, that could have been written yesterday because it's so darn relevant. Mm. Um, you know, it's, so, it's, uh, it's prolific. It's prolific. I mean, it really is prolific. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, and you see, so yeah, wow. Oh, that's good. No, no, I like that. I like that. So yeah, so you know, I don't think I answered your question. So getting me up in the morning, I, I just I went on to stoicism there for a minute, didn't I? Um uh my I, I think, yeah, so gratitude definitely does get me kicked off for sure. Um then there's that initial 
mad monkey that goes off in the brain about all the things to be done that day, right? Uh, and then that's when I have to kind of stop. Okay, I just need some 10 minutes to do a little bit of clear the brain out and then get going. You know, get that mind in the right gear. Yeah, well, get, 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 this is not, you're not getting to flow then. You're, not, you're kind of like you're trying to just plan. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> No, no, actually quite the opposite. I flow, if that's the right word, I think it's just clearing the clutter in my brain and just, uh, you know, all of that noise that happens straight away and just say, okay, and just calm myself down. Okay, what are the two or three big things for today? Even though I want to hit a hundred of those. No, you're a human. You've got to look after yourself. You're only going to be as effective as well as you can focus. So Mm. What it, and that's really against my natural tendency because normally I want to get up and fly and just get going with a bunch of different things. <laughs> and again, maybe it's maybe it's coming to the mid-century that's just changing the way I am. But uh, yeah, getting up is just like, okay, be happy, be grateful, calm that brain, then get going. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like... Um... If you go back in history, you know, you go back to the Trojans, yeah? Yeah. You know, we Another that. history lesson. Exactly. Well, you know, if you go back to the Trojans, you think about the, the warrior type of existence that they had, where they were always, they were always fighting with somebody usually. Um, and they were training to be battle-ready and, you know, warrior-like mm. and manly and all that kind of stuff. And um, there's no time for, like, you know, you, you can't, there's no time, you know, you, come on, come on, you're going to go and kill somebody. You know, you're going to go mm. and put some knife, some knife in somebody. Mm. Um, so I suppose it's that kind of yin and yang into it about you know calmness and sto- you know stoic you know meditation and then uh, then you know then you get you then you get big you, you put your armor on and you have to go off to go off to war. So absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to say it's, it, it's amazing how um, the the words of people traverse time. Mm. And people can then still relate to them, as you pointed out. You know, we're all humans. We're, you know, we're. So it's um, no, it's, it's great. I think it's fantastic. No, that's I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. That's a great. That's a, that was a great little interlude. That was. <laughs> no, no, but anybody's listening. Anybody that's listening, I would recommend. I would recommend, depending where you are in your journey, to 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 research and, and read some of that stuff because it will it will open your mind. Definitely. It does. Look, I was brought up. I don't know, I might be going a bit off tangent here, Andrews. Um, but, I, you know, I was brought up as a Sikh. <clears throat> and Sikhism is a very new religion. It's 400 odd years old. And so it's quite open in the way it thinks about other religions, you know. They're all just different paths to one God. So I was brought up in that environment. I'm not a practicing Sikh. You know, hey, I'm shaven. I don't have a turban. And, and I like my tequila. Um, and then my wife, she was brought, <laughs> she was brought up as a Hindu, you know. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, okay. And, and then the kids went to a Christian school, and and you know. Mm. So, but I've really gotten into reading about Taoism, Buddhism, you know. So I, I think more people can just, you know, like you say, just open their mind to different ways of thinking and being that can only be good for the world because no one religion can say they've got it nailed. Yeah, I mean, it gives you one, it gives you those different lenses, those different perspectives, and it also allows you to be, depending on what people's backstory are, to be more empathetic to mm. their their journey and where they are. And you know, we, we're not all experts in every single area, but it definitely, is, it definitely, I think, reading around that stuff, as you said, is incredibly valuable. Mm. Um, I, I, put, I, put, I, put, I put a post on LinkedIn with a, a stack of books that I've been reading and it, it created a 4,000 views on LinkedIn and it created like a, everybody submitting their, their book recommendations. Well, it was quite, you know, it's quite interesting. So maybe I've got to do that every, every, uh, every, every month. This is the current Andrew, Andrew book, book stack. Um, but then that, have- that, that doesn't even have the ones I've got on Audible or Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> and and how, how was your... Uh- cadence or tact of getting through those how do you how do you keep because you know similar i've got a stack right so i've got my i've got i'm looking behind i've got five shelves my bottom shelf is the ones that i've read and i after about half an hour i'm like i can't get into this so they're going off to be recycled through world of books um then i've got two shelves that are work, wait, waiting to be used, right? Uh, and then I've got two shelves that are, I love them. I'm sounds, holding like a, them. sounds like a factory model, this is. It's like, you know, you've got raw materials. <laughs> and like, 
you know, just about to be put on the production line and in in the factory. They're in they're in Ravi's factory. I, I've six sigmarized my bookshelves. <laughs> I've six sigmarized. Yeah, it was, yeah. The, the ones the ones that go to the world of books are uh, basically defects. Yeah. They, sorry, you didn't engage me in the first five seconds. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah. So so what, how did you get with your stack? I mean, do you give yourself time every day to read? I mean, because I know I come off the wagon. There's been days I just don't get to reading because there's so much stuff to do. No, I, I kind of try and I have certain blitzes during a week where I'll read a book in two hours. You know, so I'll do speed mm. reading on it. Yeah. Um, and um, so I'll do, I'll do about three, at least three a week. Wow. That's good so, cadence. So, cool. um, yeah, no, it's, it's um, but the thing is, that they're, getting, they're getting a bit hacked off me, I think, Amazon, you know, to so keep having these deliveries. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, I think yeah. I mean, I, I don't actually add up how many books I've got. I've actually got a lot of books in the garage, which I've, I've from my uh, went for my master's degree, which I've not touched for a while. But probably that will be <laughs> that will be that will drive the household crazy if I start digging all those out. I think. Anyway, <laughs> so so thank you for sharing what what's going on in your mornings. It's it's good to hear that that habits and that that kind mm. of approach to it because I think it's a good that's a good way of approaching things rather than being, being a bull at a gate. Um, <laughs> I spent you know, thirty years that way, and I realised there's got to be a better way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, I think that's, that's the thing is, I suppose you think about it. We, you know, we both ran through some ex- common experiences where you, you get you kind of get con- conditions and certain behaviours. Um, I suppose that was that was one of the things I was going to ask you about was, you know, what what are you well what are you what's what's what, what are you working on at the moment? What what's in your world? What what what's occupying your time apart from, um meditation and uh, reading about Marx Aurelius. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and also just uh, trying as hard as we can as a cohort of four people living under the same roof, keeping everything relatively stable during this lockdown time, right? Which we have to acknowledge, right? It's a tough gig, right? And, um, you know, it, it, it's so, and almost goes against a social desires and needs as human beings right um but what occupies my time gosh okay so i would say the big thing that's shifted for me in the last probably about four years is kind of how we're pivoting the business and the stuff that i'm working on now um so a bit of background look we've been running this business now for uh, actually 20 years this year yeah it was set up in 2001 Four points. Um, and during that time, whilst we've gone out and did, you know, client work, we've always had this kind of separate arm where we did pro bono work for charities or give right. money as our, our kind of little mini CSR, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought that's kind of how businesses sharp and do good. And so I was getting all warm and fuzzy and, you know, because it was all nice stuff. And then I read a book, um, for life of me, I can't come up and re- remember how I came across it, but a book by a marketing professor called Raj Sisodia called Conscious Capitalism. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, I re- and I read that book within in three hours, I think it took it, uh, and it's something inside me was like, oh, that's what, uh, you know, some of the stuff I was thinking about and were doing, but the bunch of stuff I hadn't even considered is, that's how businesses could operate. And, and it kind of, mm. you know, like I said, it's something inside which went, wow, I'll, I'm, I'll, I want to do this. This is what it's about. This feels right for me. So I then, uh, you know, contacted Raj by LinkedIn and said, hey, I just love what you wrote about in your book. How can I get involved? How can I do some of this stuff? And then, uh, you know, he said, look, I've actually got my first cohort of cons- certificate consultants starting the month after. So I'm like, okay, I'm in. So anyway, I did a, a just over a year long journey learning about hundreds of other businesses that you know are what you could call in quotes conscious businesses, and uh, and then you know been starting to apply that. Now, the, how that falls out in terms of what occupies my mind um, is one of the things that we've done as a business. We've kind of pivoted to the type of work we do. We're always thinking about how do we make this work more meaningful for the world and for the people that we're doing it with. But separately, um, I kicked off a podcast as well, Good Business Talking, which, you know, <laughs> I completely naively went into thinking, I like talking to people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Podcasts surely can't be that much of a, 
a, a, a resource drain. Little did I realize just how much effort it does take to actually get a good quality podcast going. But um, yeah, you know, nine episodes later, uh, that's a big part of my thinking. It's just, right. you know, how do I find the right organizations, the right leaders for me to talk to and to help spread the message that business can be a force for good? That's it. So that's a big portion of my time. Um, the second biggest portion of my time is yeah working on projects for our clients clients um and gosh they range from if i think about the live clients right now i've got one piece which is building the strategy for an organization that's going to disrupt the transportation industry so that's going to be really exciting to see what happens in the next couple of years okay Uh, got another organization that is a, is a small consulting business that was set up in March 2000. And they're now trajectory to around 60 consultants within one year. So how do you help them? What, the hiring, hiring, hiring 60 consultants in one year? Yeah, they'll be, at six, they'll be gone from zero to 60 within a year. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and, the, and uh, what I love about that business is, is four founding partners, they want to make that business more than just profit. They want to be doing good stuff in the world. So that's really exciting. So that's I'm quite able a, to kind of nicely aligned to what you just talked about. Yeah. Exactly. It beautifully marries up that stuff. And then uh, the other client we're working with, which is really, really interesting given the dynamic of what's happening there, is an organization that does research <clears throat> translation uh, for. Uh, vaccines and antibodies and so they're currently partnered up with a big drug company trying to figure out a covid vaccine and a covid antibody so helping them in the last that's pretty months, timely then <laughs> well but you, you can imagine right that what is going on in that organization it's not a big organization um just what they've had to deal with in the last 12 months you know again coming back to stoicism you kind of think Actually, my life's pretty okay. It's quite stable because they are busting a gut. Their blood, sweat, and tears are going on for hundreds of people just trying to figure out how do we get this virus out of this world. Um, and so it really shows up there, you know, people that are really, truly mission-led. So what's occupying my time? Podcast one, um, helping clients get to where they want to get to, too. And then quite honestly, um, Andrew, just making sure my body feels fit you know i've had a few issues in the last year and just keeping that strong and going and uh yeah so it all stays connected the mind and the body and the spirit to some degree with the stoic stuff that's good that's good that's a good that's a good explanation i like that sounds like you've got some, you've got a lot going a lot of diversity in in what you're working on i mean for is it from electric cars to vaccines is that on maybe electric vehicles i don't know well, well, it's. Um, I, I, I think the biggest. Quite, it's quite a broad. It's quite a broad spectrum. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, look, we've been industry agnostic f- ever since we started, um, and I think in the space that we play in, I think that's a strength, because ultimately, what we're about is just helping businesses manage change effectively. And there's so much you can learn from different industries. So, so much. I'm going to give you a really simple example, right? So we worked for a healthcare provider a few years ago, here in Surrey, in fact. Um, you know, 110 district nurses out in, a, in, a, in, a, in the patch of this region, um, supporting the patients in their homes. And they had a real issue with scheduling, diary management, route optimization. And, you know, getting there, we, what they were doing was your typical pen and paper Diaries of 110 district nurses, and in a small circum, uh, di- sorry, in an area of 10 square miles, this company was wrapping up over a million driving miles a year. Wow! <laughs> yeah, and you think, hang on, but because we've done a ton of work in logistics, mm. straight away we were able to help them with. Hang on, there's a much smarter way you can get this stuff done. So that so we've always kept it that way. We we love I've got to say love the diversity. Um, you know, could be a COVID vaccine clinical trial organisation. It could be a helicopter taxi company, which we've done some work with in Belgium. 
or it could be a company that's just about to disrupt the uh, freight industry. So, a, I, helico- and I, and I like a heli- helicopter taxi company. Yeah. So this is uh, actually an organisation that shuttles people to oil rigs, to wind farms, okay. to ships, so they can then do what they do. So yeah, that kind of taxi. Well, no, you, not, see, not you, you see, I, I, we're not because obviously I'm I'm very close to you today. Obviously, well, I'm not in the posh bit. I'm in the kind of you know, <laughs> not quite in the east end of London or whatever, but you know, slightly more located within ten miles or twenty miles from you. But um, no, no. But normally, you see, I have to fly the G and T session sponsored helicopter to another country to see my guest. You see, so <laughs> luckily, you know, we don't have to do that. I can just you know jump on jump in an Uber. <laughs> next time um, you go I'll be your entourage Andrew let me be your entourage on your next trip <laughs> yeah you can come fly around the world with me it's fine you know we get, well, I'm going to get, we get well, you know don't, don't worry we're going to be releasing very shortly you know the, the swag store so you better get hoodies you know you better get travel bags you know mugs yeah it's the future <laughs> Sign me up. it's the future <laughs> so um no, but it's interesting because I think, and I suppose we'll, I wanted to cover this next, is, is about, it's interesting what you're working on. But I think, it, it, so there's a bit about what I would call superpowers, right? Gifted and talented mm. superpowers. Mm. Um, and also, I know that your lovely uh, business partner and wife, uh, very for a very long time, like I've known you, um, Hooty, and and do you think that the the way you can cope or or help and support these types of organisation, this diversity, it, it, what, what, why do you think you can do that? Is that back, back on some things you've done before or is it just some, some superpowers you've developed over time? <laughs> um, wow, that's a great question, Andrew. Uh, okay, a couple of things come to my mind. I think having a level of curiosity, I think, is really, really important. <clears throat> and I think by working in lots of different industries, you can't go in and think you know it all, right? Whereas had we spent 20 years working purely in banking or in insurance or in logistics, you get to know the lay of the land. You get to know the key challenges. You get to know the key technologies. You, you get to, So I think it's, it becomes easier to go in and think you know answers. Um, so I think... Being the the dumb consultant allows, and doing it in very different industries, you just start to ask very pertinent questions. And it, and uh, it's funny, it just reminded me of a call I had this morning with a client. It's just going through a few questions. And, and that comment that you get back, oh, I never thought of that. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's the most naive, straightforward, logical question to ask. But I think it comes from a place of not being entrenched in one place too long. So mm. I think that curiosity or, or that, you know, I, I have to learn and I have to learn really, really quickly. And I think by the type of questions that you have to ask, how quickly you have to be able to connect dots, I think probably helps. And that is something that, yeah, you do it and you do it day in, day out. That probably does start to become a bit of a capability. So I think that's helpful. Um, I think the other piece I would say, which goes totally against what you know I learned at GE, right, when we were back there in the Welch days. You know, as you know, I kind of was brought up there in the Six Sigma we? world. Were we, <clears throat> were we there? Were we there? <laughs> what, you mean the famous meatball company? Indeed. Meatballs, famous... meatballs, eat those funky meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, because it was all about data, right? It's all about data. Give me the evidence. In fact, I remember my boss, Joel, he had a sign at the back of his desk and it says in god we trust others bring data uh, fantastic i don't know, still i love that i love that um, quote um but i think and it might be a case of experience and just seeing lots of things is uh, i i use a lot of intuition as well when i'm working and I think that's where you have to kind of get the human connection. Mm. I'm, I'm a relatively social guy. Um, I can generally get on with people from all as, um, you know, places in life. And I think being able to connect with people um, in a very humane way, um, because everyone has different triggers, I think is super important as well. And I think 
you know, not allowing your personality to be dumbed down when you're working. I think allow your personality to show. Just be yourself. I think the more authentic people can be at work, I think I think that's a superpower. You know, as long as you're not a complete asshole, part of the expression. But if you can just show up who you are, you're going to be more confident. You're going to be in a better place internally. Naturally, then you're just going to do a better job. Um, so I think those two things I would say is probably the thing. So it's curiosity in asking the questions and just um, just be yourself because you know what? No one there's a there's a great book uh, by a guy called uh, Naval Ravikant. He's one uh, he's a very successful uh, investor in Silicon Valley, and he's got a book out called The Almanac of Ravi, Naval Ravikant. And in there he says one of the powers that you, everyone has is themselves. Because no one could copy it. Yeah. No, you, you are you, a you're, you're a you're, you're a unique fingerprint, or yeah. you're, you're you're a unique combination. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and embrace that. And because I'll tell you what, the number of years. So I'm an, I'm a coach as well, right? And in order to become a certified coach and to be any good at what you do, you've got to clear your own crap out as well, because otherwise your filter will overlay how you show up for people, and. Uh, you know, everyone's got demons. Everyone's got some superpowers, and and I think you know the twenty. Everyone's got some. Everyone's got some Darth Vader. Is that what you're saying, or is it? Is uh, it? I like it. Yeah, Darth Vader's. I like it. Everyone's got a Darth Vader. Everyone's got a Jedi's as well, right? You got Darth Vader's, and you got Jedi's in your in yourself, and so you can spend time fixing or addressing your Darth Vader's, which are important if they're really detrimental to people in the world. You got to sort that stuff out. But focus on your Jedi's because the more you can focus on your strength, and you're going to feel free. And then the more you feel free, you feel just the more awesome you're going to be. So I think the more you know, getting that insight, I think is super important. And uh, yeah, it's always a. I try to get but those do, conversations. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, you're going to, you're going to finish off. Sorry, you try to get those conversations. Yeah, you know, with the kids, you know, mm. and uh, oh, dad's going to have one of his lessons and. <laughs> <laughs> to dumb it down quite a lot, but I just wish I had that awakening much earlier it's, in my it's, life. It's hashtag listen with Rafster. That's what it is. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah, you see, if you if you start developing your own hashtags, then you get more social acceptance from the kids. Uh, oh, okay. Now, and a TikTok account. Well, you see, how you see? Well, you know, you don't, I don't know if you know this story, but I actually have I have a TikTok account, okay. but my two sons have banned me from putting videos on it. But that was last year. So this year. Watch your space. It's all free, right? <laughs> well, actually, I actually did a, I did a video and I put it on Instagram of me standing uh, doing the ice bucket challenge on Saturday. Mm. Uh, I put it on, Insta, on my personal Instagram. And uh, I got quite an interesting f- bit of feedback about that. <laughs> and I nominated my sister and my two sons to do it again, to do it. And I'm, uh, I'm waiting for their videos. That's all I have to say. What's the cause this, what's the cause this year, Anne? No, no, it's, it's just, no, it's just, it's, it's, it was just the fifteenth anniversary of my, my, my father passing away from multi neuron disease. So gotcha. I, I, it was to tribute him. It was a tribute to him. So nice. So that's, that's, that's where the, the the ice bucket challenge started. It was it was obviously through ALS and they were US and you know MND. So multi mm. disease. So yeah. Mm. So you know, I mean, next video I'll do. I can nominate you. It's fine. You know. Hey, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Hey, it's very, <laughs> it's very. I tell you, it wakes you up when all those when all those ice cubes hit your head. So I'll send you the video. How about if I do it in that garden? Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, you've got, you've got. It's, it's made for it. That is, it's perfect. I've, I've still got the snow. So <laughs> no. So I was, I was just going to. So that point you raised before about um, you know bringing your authentic self to work and being mm. being more open and more grounded, you could say, uh, mm. and not not and not worrying about the what people are going to think. Yeah. I suppose, you know, the, the question I was it just spring, triggered in my mind was about <laughs> my, it, it, it kind of sometimes, I suppose it depends what kind of organization you're working in because, you know, let's face it, we, we've got a common experience of working in an organization, which, which when I reflect on it was very, very um, culturally, very, very interesting. Mm. Uh, probably the, the the most amazing peer group that I've ever had in my life, um, because the, the quality of people there was so high, uh, the diversity of people was so high, 
Um, but my, 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 oh my, did we have to work hard? Mm. Um, and there was some kind of rituals and cultural norms that, that you were expected to follow to be successful in the long term. Yep. Um, and obviously, you know, if you, I mean, I suppose I wanted to trigger into your origin story as well about, you know, the stuff you did as well. But I mean, I suppose before we jump into that, what, what's your view on that that comment or that 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 assessment? No, no I think <clears throat> hey, that co- company was incredibly strong in terms of its culture. <laughs> Without, you know, people used to say, you know, if you cut somebody up in that organisation, they would bleed blue, not red, right? And so, yeah, it was incredibly strong, and and you could kind of see, hey, having worked in HR in that organisation those years. <laughs> I, I completely understood the rationale for it. Um, so, I, you know, about being yourself, I think that's when I talk about being yourself, it's around being true to what's important to you in terms of how, what, what, what you believe in or what's right and what's wrong and how you treat people. And I think, you know, underlying majority of people, people are good at heart. People are... are unselfish I think in general and so I think when, when I talk about people showing up and being who they are yeah there are some boundaries that some organizations put on you but if those boundaries don't feel right how are you ever going to feel you can fly and be the best version of yourself so you know we've all been in organizations where we felt it doesn't feel right it's tense or you feel agitated or aggravated or there's just tension that that's not the kind of place you want to be spending a huge amount of your time because it's not good for you in terms of your career prospects. It's not good for you in terms of your vitality and therefore it's no good for that darn organization either. So I think, you know, if there's anything, it's more around keep exploring and find the place that feels like home because only in that place are you going to be able to thrive. And I think that's really the implication of leadership too, right? So whilst you may have you know, strong overriding cultural norms and rituals in any business, whether they serve well or they don't serve very well. I think leaders' role is about how do they help those individuals, you know, thrive within that organization. And that's a one-to-one job. You can't go and do that as a team. Leadership's role is to know that each individual and figure out ways of how do they make it's, that person the best version of themselves. Yeah, it's, it's special and, and unique. And how do you yeah. how do you how do you get them to amplify their superpowers and, and talents and gifts and and manage their edges, as we used to call it in Tesco? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it all sounds nice and fluffy, but you know what? If 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 you just if anyone just took five minutes, closed their eyes, and thought about where they felt resilient, where they felt healthy, where they felt valued, probably guarantee you they've had somebody in the background that supported them, whether it's a coach, a manager, or a leader, that's really reinforced that. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's that's the role of leaders, right? It's to help people thrive. Yeah, it's, it's been, I suppose, I don't know, if it's, it's, is it this, they call it the servant leader? You know, it's a bit like, mm. I don't know if that's the correct, correct phrase, but yeah, but I, mean, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think what I would have, I, mean, I suppose my, the reason I was touching on that subject was because I think my observation with yourself and what you've done with your business is that there are definitely some superpowers that we all developed when we were at GE that I, I, I think we were, we were the, the leadership training and the, the things we had to do were ahead of, ahead of most organizations, which is why it was so successful because the, the, the focus on execution Mm. And the focus on talent development was, you know, I mean, even when I, when I went to Tesco, I mean, it's quite funny. When I went to Tesco and uh, I was doing some work um, before I did some, some stuff in Tesco Bank and then obviously the telecom stuff, mobile, um, I went to see the guys in Tesco Academy. And I started looking at the stuff they got on Tesco Academy, which is like leadership development, L&D. And I go, this looks like stuff from Cronenville. Mm. And they go, what you mean? You know Crotonville? And I said, yeah, I'm ex-GE. She said, oh, we actually went over there. We went to see the guys in GE Crotonville, and they explained everything they did on leadership development. And yeah, we have packaged it all up and put it into Tesco. 
<laughs> which I thought, well, not, not everything, but there was a lot of it was was basically repackaged for the how to develop leaders in Tesco. Obviously, there was some other stuff they did with Gemini Consulting. Mm. But, you know, I was like blown away. I was like, whoa, that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so no, it, I it just... It just shows that, it just shows how... You know, we went through that shared experience, that common experience. I know we're in different areas and different functions, but it just shows, you know, you don't realize what you're going through when you're going through it. Uh, no, you don't. And But you're spot on, though. I think what they did at Crateville was absolutely world-class, absolutely leading edge. And, you know, if I think about the work that I do now, some of the stuff might refer back to, you know, what we called workout, right? Which is basically oh, getting people cap. together. Cap. You mean yeah. cap and, next. Yeah. Yeah, and then there was cap. And, and so... Bullet train, bullet, bullet you're gonna train. Get, gonna get bullet train in there. Cross selling. Um, so yeah, it's all in, and, and, I, and even to this day, I remember what would the thing. You know, there's another club we do some stuff around leadership values, and, I, and you know, all of a sudden there's this list, and it's like a shopping list. It just doesn't. No, no, but this has to be memorable. And surely in my mind, Kate went to energy, edge, and execution. You know, it was so clear at GE, you've got to have intellectual edge, you've got to have energy to energize others, and you've got to get stuff done. And so there was a lot of very special things, I think, when Welch ran that organization, a lot, a lot of special things. You know, it's kind of, it looks like it's really lost its way now. But for sure, I think the stuff they did in terms of pumping, you know, leadership training and leading edge tools, um, for sure, was a, we were very lucky and privileged to go through that process. Mm. Yeah, you, I, think, I, think, I think because we, because I think we we were at that stage in our in in our age, you know, we were more probably we were probably more absorbing. We were more there was more osmosis and more absorbing and more open to um, being led and being coached and being yeah. You know, I wouldn't say conditioned, but there was kind of like a you know you could you you you, know, you go to an airport and you knew another the other GE people in the <laughs> airport. I mean, that's how bad it was. <laughs> That's so true. Um, That's so true. And I know that I've, I've spoke to other people from Unilever and various other big companies as well, and uh, it's the same yeah. kind of thing. You know, there's a, a very strong culture, very strong uh, ways of working. So now Ravster is is obviously now, I mean, it's DJ Ravster now. <laughs> Actually, it, I could take that another level, Andrew. Oh, here we go. Here we go. He's showing off now. He's showing off. <laughs> David, David gets his long lost brother. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so so, so for, I mean, for the audience to kind of get some context on that, so I know we were talking mm. talking about a shop then, talking like buzzwords and phrases that probably people are going bullet train, cap, <laughs> um, you know, workout. So I mean, could you give us a, a bit of a kind of an origin story? Of, you know, what 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 have you been exposed to before you set up the business you're doing now, and just to get just to give some context and sure. That'd be, that'd, be, that'd be incredibly useful, I think. And it's also, it'd be incredibly insightful, I think, for, for the audience listening. Sure. So um, the history of GE <clears throat> back in the day, you know, when Jack first took over, 480,000, I think, employees worldwide, um, not doing great performance-wise. Um, and, uh, you know, from a cultural perspective, I think he called it a, a sloth on a few occasions where... Things were slow. People didn't talk to one another. It was very difficult getting things done. So he wasn't a cheater? No, it was a sloth. <laughs> a cheater. <laughs> or an elephant might have been another word. I don't know. But elephants are quite wise, aren't they, apparently? Um, and so he had, uh, you know, his big challenge was how does he get this organisation to shift its way of being and you know you, you might recall you know he got nicknamed neutron jack because he downsized the organization from something like four hundred eighty thousand to 280 or so over a number of years so massive massive restructuring and then part of that change was also shifting how the culture how people show up and how the culture works and the ways of working so the first thing that he put in place was this concept called work hour. And work hour is incredibly naive and simple, but it's incredibly transformational from a cultural perspective. And all it was, was simply that when you've got a problem to solve, give it a big, hairy, audacious goal, a bag goal. Really challenge people to 
thinking differently of how they're going to resolve this. So, for example, I know I remember some of the workouts I facilitated, but you know, it's how do we generate 50% more sales within 12 months? That, that's the kind of goal you go into a workout with. So you've got a problem or you've got an opportunity, give it a big objective. Then you make sure you get all of the data and the evidence around it beforehand. And then it's literally a lock-in session. And that lock-in might be four hours. It could be five days, depending upon what needs to be unlocked. And you get all of the right plays together in a room. And you ain't going to get done until you've come up with ideas that then get signed off at the end by something called a town hall, which are the senior members of the executive team. So you are literally, you've got a really tough target. You get all the data and analysis done beforehand. And then all with all the right players or the right actors, cast of characters in a room, you are working through a very structured process to data analysis, ideation, prioritization, recommendation creation, business case development. And at the end of that period, whether it's four hours or whether it's five days, you've got to pitch back to the senior leaders and they have to say, yes, we accept that recommendation. No, we don't accept it. Here's the reason why. Or we need more information and you need to get that information to back to us within 48 hours and we'll make a decision. So what it, and then once for all the yeses, you implement it and you've got a very tight time frame and it's you have, are reviewed on a weekly basis of how the stuff is progressing. So um, incredibly simple in terms of the design, but fundamental transformative in terms of how people went about fixing problems or seizing opportunities. Because it's, it's like, just, it's, it's, it's like agile, agile on steroids, but with accountability. <laughs> Totally on steroids and accountable. Yeah, there was no hiding of this stuff. Well, I mean, I, 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 I remember when, when uh, so I was, I was, uh, you know, we were together in G lighting EMEA, yeah? Mm. So, you know, literally, I remember one, I, I was, we had a couple of different CEOs when I was there. We had Chuck, Chuck Piper, you probably remember, mm -hmm. Charles Piper, mm -hmm. legend, Vietnam legend. He's running a software company, he's chairman of a software company now in, in Boston. Uh, Hi, hi, Chuck, yep. if you're listening to this episode, amazing guy. And <laughs> Mark, awesome. ja Mark Jameson was the CFO, who is probably the most amusing but hard CFO. He's just like celebrity CFO I've ever worked with. Hilarious. And um, big shout out to Mr. Jameson there. And, um, but, you know, literally when you, when you go into the, the – when you, when you have the final review at the workout with Mark and Chuck, oh, my God. It was, it was, it was you know, it was hardcore. Uh, so, you know, you, you cannot leave the room until this gets nailed and sorted out. I mean, it's like, it's, very, it's like, it's a bit like, um, yeah, it's quite a compelling, it's quite an interesting, it, it, makes, it definitely makes you grow up quickly. <laughs> well, it does. And, and, but you know what's really interesting about the workout itself? It's just that it's based, it's based on some really simple fundamentals. Get the right stakeholders together. Yeah. Uh, and talk this through together, understanding all the implications and interests we will have. And then when it comes to then implementing, figure out what's going to be, you know, who's the resources, what timelines, you know, what's, what resources do you need? And then you commit and, there's, and it's completely transparent in terms of making it happen. So again, the fundamentals are incredibly simple. Um, I guess it goes back to kind of factor analysis, you know, what are the root cause of all of these things? But what it did for a culture, really, as you experienced yourself, was just incredible. Anytime there was anything big that needed to be addressed, okay, let's get an all workout organized. And, and things just happened as a result. Things got done. Well, you had, you, had, you, had the, you had the exec sponsorship. You know, you could basically, you know, you could go and walk and see the CFO and the CEO and, and because you'd been on that session with him or with, you know, the, with the team. And you had that complete transparency to get, to get things done, um, yeah. which is, you know, when you think about the, you know, organizational treacle, that I've, I've observed in other organizations I've worked in since then, you know, it just, it just, it's, it's night and day. So, mm. but, you know, mm. it's, 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 I think it was useful to explain that because I think for people that listen to this episode, you know, that, that, that those principles apply today, even more so, you know, with the, you know, we talked about a bit of the G and stuff, but, you know, the technology stuff that's happening these yeah. days, where it's, where it's disrupting industries, you know, the, 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 the work ethic and the, uh, the ability to execute, um, and turn on sixpence, you know, whether you're a, you know, an organization with 480,000 employees or 200,000 employees or 10 or two, you know, the same kind of principles would, would stand you in good stead. Yeah. 
And, and you know what? It comes down to <clears throat> collaboration. Just, just work together on this stuff. Um, the right involvement of in cal- calibrating and being accountable. I mean, I, if you really had to dumb it down, it's collaboration and accountability. Mm. That's what Workout did. And yeah, and then as you know, they built on that with the bullet train, and the bullet train was literally having a core, dedicated group of people that are going to make this stuff happen over a long period of time. You know, you've got the, like you said, the senior sponsor. You've got the right people. They, you know, other priorities have been pushed aside. So there's never an issue around. Bullet, I've got doot, doot, bullet train coming through. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I haven't got time. And you know, if you're being asked to join a bullet train, you had better make the time and space to get there because that's that's important. That was a clear strategic priority. Um, so yeah, and, and then you know, there's then there was a whole piece around cross selling. You know, at that point, G had 12 different businesses, and each business was huge, tens of thousands of people. Yet there was limited leverage of one another's products and services and just sales like lots, lots, of si- lots of silos yeah incredible silos so i think what cross selling did again in a really simple design way is to force those interactions between the different commercial leaders of those businesses and said okay i sell uh, i sell this uh, power system to this client oh okay we sell plastic to them. Oh, hang on. Maybe we should. And they might need some financing. Oh, okay. And you know what? They have a car fleet it's for their staff. And then all of a sudden, you see all of these opportunities and you go with them with a package. Boy, that created compelling in terms of. But you, what you, you, but could you, do. But you, you know, we, I think we both know why that played out like that. And my, my, my take on it was because of the way that, the, you know, the way that Jack r- ran the business. Was basically like twelve. He had twelve castles, yeah, mm. um, and he had twelve very, very capable lieutenants. You could say, or sergeant majors, who were running each of those businesses. Who were, you know, very, very. I mean, you know, Jim McNerney, who was light at lighting as well for a while, became the CEO of 3M, became the CEO of Boeing. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the leadership talent in GE was just mind-boggling, mm. brilliant. You know, brilliant, um, and. Um, you know, if you think about it, that you know, to 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 to, to navigate those organisational boundaries was was quite a challenge. You know, to to, to get people to talk to each other across business and realise there's a bigger play here rather than just their P and L. Yeah, but you know what? <clears throat> Again, I'll, that, I will. Does that, does, that, does that make sense? Completely. But I'll tell you what I will attribute to Jack, which I think was also a massive cultural win for him, uh, was uh, whenever he did his business reviews. No, um, I think we were biannual. He'd come along, spend two or three days, you know, understanding how that business unit was doing. You know, you probably pitched him a number of times, you know, and it was two or three day event. What was the first day? It was people and culture. Let's let, let's really look at and assess who are our senior leaders, who are their succession plans, what are their development plans, which business are we going to move them on to now? Who are the, how high, are they sh- who are the, who are the high pots? Who are the five ones? Exactly. And, and, you know, <laughs> and, and so it, for me, you know, when CEO of an organization of 280,000 at that point was the most profitable company in the world, right? For 25 years, quarter on quarter, um, and, you know, his demonstration of the importance of people and culture shows itself, up, shows itself up when business reviews start with people and culture review. Then we go on to finances. I mean, that's yeah, because that, cause that's, cause that's not always the same in everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Mm. Not quite. But that speaks volumes, you know. Um, it shows yeah. you where he, he, he knew the key lever was to drive performance. And then, as you know, you know, after that, then Six Sigma came in to drive efficiency and then Lean came in. So there's, there, what, what they did, there was always a pipeline of corporate business initiatives that will continue to optimize the way that business operated or made them more effective in how they operated. So I think that was one of the yeah, big it was, yeah, I mean, I suppose it, links to, it links to continuous change, isn't it? Continuous learning, continuous yeah. change. I mean, yeah. the, the, I mean I, before, we'll, jump, we'll jump off of this topic as well, obviously we could talk for hours on GE, but my, 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 on Six Sigma, my, I remember uh, seeing the email from Gary Reiner, who was this, the, the kind of CIO, chief information officer of, of Jack of Jack's team, 
because they would put out some Six Sigma training, you know, to do green belt and black belt training to become analytically capable to work out to measure processes and things like that to become a better measure, measuring using data. Mm-hmm. And, and nobody had booked on the courses, like hardly anybody had booked on the courses for green belt and black belt. And then suddenly Gary sent this email out to the whole company saying, please book on the course. If you do not, please reconsider your career opportunities in the future. And suddenly the whole course would fall up. <laughs> it's like, send for more courses. <laughs> I remember that. I don't know if you were around then, but it was hilarious. It was hilarious, the reaction. No, I, I, I do remember the point where 70% of all stock option grants only went to black belts. Again, you know, because if you think carrot and stick, what you just described there was the stick. If you don't come along, then you can go and find somewhere else to work. And then quite quickly, the carrot came along saying, okay, if you really want to financially, at this point anyway, it was financially get on. But also there was a very specific talent succession review for people that were in Six Sigma. You know, how do we accelerate them? So if you want to advise your career and you want to make some more money, then you need to be doing this stuff. So I, I actually think they might, they realised <laughs> that, you know, this is not good for your career. It's not the right message to send out. <laughs> let's just, let, 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 yeah, let's encourage people to do it. <laughs> yeah, coax them. So, so, so I, mean, I, I mean, just to touch in briefly on, on your personal story, because I know you, you, yeah. you went into the GE story. I mean, you, 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 you know, you've had some interesting roles in, in your backstory, which before you obviously started up your own business. Could you give the audience a bit of a pen portrait on that, just so they can appreciate how you traversed industries and traversed different functions? Sure. Um, okay, so maybe just a bit of context around that. If I just give you a couple of minutes about my background. So I'm a son of two immigrant parents. You know, They came over from India in 1966. <clears throat> my dad had to leave school when he was nine um, because his, um, there was death in the family. He had to go and plow the fields and all of that stuff, which is unfortunate. But anyway... Um, and then, um, so he never really got an education because um, he was the guy that had to earn the money. And, and so when he got married to my mom, by the way, my dad was 17 and my mom was 13 when they got married, right? They wow. saw each other, they saw each other on the wedding day. <laughs> so can you just imagine that? Oh, that, was the, that was the first date. First, the first date was you're married. So that, okay. And my mom was 13, so frightening to think about it now, right? Anyway, so they came over to the UK, not a lot of money in the, they had 25 quid, I think, in their pocket back then. Anyway, and through a lot of hard graft, you know, dad started off in Fords, then they had a shop, uh, then they had a carpet cleaning business, and then a driving instructor, you know, all very manual jobs. And so what we, whilst we may not have had material wealth, we had an incredible amount of love, support, and also push <laughs> to, to do better and I, and I think that that grit if that's the right word and I love that book by the way by Andrew Duckworthy grit you know is is I think a big part of what drove me in good ways and in bad ways too so what was very clear from the outset was study 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 so anyway so I was lucky enough to get through my there was go to university and, and, and actually it was at university where I came across this opportunity uh, and it was pitched as run your own business in sales and marketing. I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And uh, what I found then subsequently found out what it actually was is not door to door selling in America. <laughs> really? <laughs> so and at that pro- time, it was called BUNAC, British Universities North American Club. But anyway, I joined this organization called Southwestern. And I, you know, on my own costs, I went to uh, the States and the Midwest got a week's worth of training and started knocking on doors, um, literally knocking on doors with a 20 kilogram bag of book of samples and demonstrating books, kind of like let's study guide, you know, to help kids through all the way from preschool up to um, pre-college in the US. And, and the idea of this was, okay, so you're a student at university. So in the summer, you go to America and you knock on doors and you earn commission only revenue. So if you're not selling anything, you're a bit buggered because you spent all that money to get out there. And, and and one of the key pivot moments for me was in my, after my first week, I gave up. I got on my phone to my dad. He goes, I said, Dad, I've had it. I can't do this. I was crying my eyes out. I was like, I don't want to do this. I want to come home. And my mom was saying, yeah, you come home. My dad was like, don't you dare. You stay there and learn something about yourself. I don't care if you don't make a penny, but you stay there and learn something about who you are. <laughs> 
And that's what I needed to hear. And that's it. And then I started selling. So interesting pivot for me, even now, you know, at age 50, I still remember that when I was 18, that was a real moment for me. Uh, and again, that's I think... Because he, he, he was being supportive as well, wasn't he? He was giving you, he was kind of guiding you, coaching you, giving you some words of encouragement. Well, you know what? It was tough love as well. What I realised afterwards, I yeah, hated it at yeah. that time, but it was tough love. That's what I needed, right? Um, and so anyway, so I did that and at university. So throughout my whole year at four years at King's, every summer I would go to the States, knock on doors and sell books. But when I was at the university, I would hire other students and then it was a network marketing. So I would earn revenue on their sales. And uh, so that was my first exposure to, oh, you can make money in a different way rather than being purely employed. I mean, my final year at university, I made $30,000. And I'm like, that's a pretty good gig when you're 22 years old, you know, for a summer holiday job. Wow. Um, so that kind of, that opened my eyes. Oh, this is interesting. It's, it's on the back of that, that I actually ended up doing my MBA because I saw how much management was really, really important to any kind of success. And so I don't know anything about management. So I did the MBA at CAS. And after that, that's when I joined GE, um, you know, in, in their HR leadership program. And I spent a good two years doing change projects, then got to someone to do my Six Sigma stint and then really spent the next four years doing a whole bunch of stuff around business improvement. And it was back then, it was early 90s. It was the first dot-com bubble, Andrew. 2000, 2000, you mean? Yeah, and I got lured. Not lured, I got greedy and I jumped ship and I joined a dot-com called Stepstone. And uh, six months later, they got dot belly up, is what I like to call it. So everything went. So I was there in my mid-20s. I, on paper, I was really quite wealthy. <laughs> but six months later, that was worth nothing because they'd gone bankrupt. So if there's, a, if there's a story in there, it's don't chase the money. <laughs> Don't chase the money. It doesn't work out as a motivation. What, 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 what year was that then? What year was that? Was that the 2000s, like dot-com boom and bust? Uh, so if I recall, it would have been about, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it would have been about 2001, 2002, that sort of time frame. Yeah. Wow. The first, uh, yeah, when last last minute dot-com was just exploded. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, but but you, you, weren't the only, you weren't the only GE executive or senior person or GE alumni that did that. Because there's, yeah. quite, there's quite a few other well-documented people who left and then actually went back. They went back to GE. I know, I, know, I don't know if you did that, but, you know, it, it's so... <laughs> anyway. No, I didn't. I remember um, who was it? the CTO went to Webvan, which I think went belly up as well. Yeah, Stuart, um, so Scott, yeah. That's Stuart Scott. Yeah, that's the guy I was, I was thinking about. Yeah. Sure, exactly. Um, and actually, then, but then after that, there was a Scott Schenkel. He, he he picked a winner. He went to eBay. He's now running eBay. So <laughs> he done a pretty good. He, he did a good selection, Scott. Um, so then after um, you know having the scars of uh, the dot com crash, I I went back to familiar territory, um, and that has been business improvement. So I joined Zurich Financial Services, and I set up their internal um, business improvement function for the UK. And a couple of years later, I did it for Europe. And then there was a re- request to move to Zurich. And whilst I absolutely love Switzerland, I mean, what a beautiful place. And what an amazing lifestyle. Culturally, it just didn't fit well with me in terms of how we are as a family. So then I just, and then I moved on to an organization called CHEP. And CHEP is a, a pallet pooling company. So, you know, companies move their products on these big blue pallets made of wooden nails. Interestingly, though, Andrew, the, the business actually isn't about pallets. It's about data and reverse shipping. And that's really how they make their money because they have knowledge of the data of goods being moved across the world. So they're actually a data mining company rather than a pallet company. Um, so I spent four years running their global business improvement team. And then it was uh, 2008 where I joined my wife. She started this business back in 2001. And said, oh, why don't we make this uh, something together? And uh, yeah, took it from there. Opened up our black book of uh, people that we've worked with. Had them join, you know, some of them joined us as associates and uh, really just knocking on doors of people that we work with in industry and said, this is what we do. Can we help in any way? And then the business started from there. So it's all through our own black book of people that we've worked with in the past. And the rest is history, as they say, Andrew. (laughs) 
No, no, but it's interesting because, I mean, it's interesting thanks for sharing that because I think it's an interesting, you know, explanation of, of you know, where, you know, that, that thing where you, you know, where you started, you know, you took the risk and then, you know, you, you learned from that and then you, you kind of jumped into something, you know, I suppose something more, 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 more mature. But then, obviously, you know, built your superpowers, and then you know, transition into another, you know, into another industry, really. I suppose. But I know. Yeah. Well, no, it's interesting. A couple of things from what you just said. I think one is, you know, you talk about superpowers, but I, by the time I had left, by the time I was in Chep, I was very clear what I was good at, and like you said, that's when I then had the confidence to say, okay, I'm going to do this on my own. And mm. My wife and I, we're going to because it was really clear through the feedback and the impact that, okay, I can do this stuff. I'm mm. now happy to take a risk and do it uh, without a uh, secure income. Interestingly enough, I my first day on Four Points was uh, Black Monday, 2008. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, wow, really? Yeah. And the four projects that we had in the pipeline for me to go straight into after I left all cancelled that week. So it was an interesting first three months. Like, oh, okay, we've all of a sudden lost all income, all income. And now what do we do? And so for three months, it was a blessing in disguise because you spent that three months really thinking about, you know, what is our offering? You know, who do we want to work with? What kind of people do we want to have join us? And then we actually, I think, much more thoughtfully thought about the business. And I think that's what helped us kind of accelerate a little bit more faster than we would have otherwise gone into a bit more of a cushioned, I've got four four contracts and let's carry on. Now, the, yeah, the flip so, side... So, so rather, than, rather than just doing projects and then hoping there's a pattern forms and hoping you'll work on the proposition later. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Working on the business less than the business. Exactly. You got it. Mm. Um, now, interestingly enough, and this is a very personal story, obviously, because, you know, my co-director is my wife. Uh, so my boss in every part of my life really working at home. And uh, <laughs> it was... About five years ago, we were actually having some marital problems, some real, real tensions. And I want to share this because I think it's a really important um, lesson for us. And what had happened is the business was doing incredibly well. We had a team of about 15 by then, you know, with some really good clients. And we were just on a good trajectory. But as a result, and by the way, also bringing up a couple of kids in the same time. But as a result of that, what we found is we were liaising with one another as colleagues and not a husband wife partnership because we, so a lot of our folk our dynamic had shifted quite significantly to the point that we actually are, we need to go and see a counselor and it's only through the counseling session we realized hey what are we doing here what are we growing why are we growing this and we've it was that kind of like a crosser saying we're on this trajectory we're running we're building this engine we've got to keep feeding this engine but there are some real negative consequences in terms of our relationship and our lifestyle and where we're spending our time. And it's at that time we said, actually, whoa, stop. Let's cull this right back down. And, you know, we said, what do we want to do? So we brought our services down from 11 different things down to four. Okay, who are the people we've loved working with in terms of our team? So we brought that down from 15, I think it was at that time, down to six. So we just cut everything down in terms of, what we do, who works with us, where we want to focus our effort. And the crazy thing is, even though we halved the number of our team, we brought down a number of services by 70%. We had our best three years year on year after that, both on revenue and profit. So I think the story there... And I, and I, and I, presume, and I presume the the domestic and family situation, relationship situation improved as well. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's really good at home now. But for me, the interesting thing was... Focus on what you're good at. Focus on what you like doing. Don't try to be all things to all people and work with people you it's easy to work with. Where where you're where you're enjoying it, there's little tension and you can trust one another. And just those things, all of a sudden, things connected up and we flourished. And so big isn't always better. Was the big insight and small is be, small is beautiful, but I know I didn't <laughs> know that you're over six foot tall, so you know it's not quite as good for you. <laughs> and I just say that because I know a lot of people say this sort of stuff, but I lived it and it really is true. You know, do the stuff you love, do the stuff you're good at, and and find people that will pay for it. That's really good. That's that's really good. That I like I like that. It's also thank you for being so you know open on sharing that 
that um, yeah. that story. Hey, we all have challenges in our lives, right? I think the more uh, authentic and more, more more genuine we can be about showing these messages, I think everyone it helps. And uh, because you know, I you know, with two daughters in the last, so we've got she's at one's eighteen and one's twenty. So we've gone through the teenage years, the, the tough part of the teenage years. Um, oh, by the way, if there are any dads out there that are having struggles with teenagers, amazing book called Un- Untangled, just beautifully written about what teenagers go through and can really relate and help them. But I think the reason why I talk about... Um, um, I've lost my train of thought now. I'm talking about... Doing what you like. Oh, yeah, the, sharing the story is because I think, you know, the, I, what does worry me about social media is people just showing all the beautiful stuff, all the wonderful things in their life. And that, that doesn't help because we know that 95% of their time is not this perfect image. You, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't seen my video from Instagram from, from the I have it. challenge. You see, you know, <laughs> then, then you, then you realise what an Adonis I am without my clothes on. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did so, comment yes. about how how nice my shorts were. Actually, they were pretty pretty snazzy shorts. But you know, right. I wasn't I wasn't completely naked, by the way. Just for just for just, <laughs> good to just, know. Just, just, for re- might... just for the record. You know. <laughs> oh, no, you're you're right. You're right. It's this thing about yeah. It's um that that has caused you, you, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there about social media about what's what's good, what's not good. I suppose it's. A, I mean, that links to us was a question I had about technology. I mean, we're on the mm. GT sessions, <laughs> the gin and tonic session. Maybe we did a gin and tonic at the end of this episode. Um, That'd be good, but <laughs> a bit too early. Um, but you know, I think what you what you talked about is you talked about a lot about the gifts and talents, and you talked about growth. You know, your personal journey and your business journey, which has been great. Um, on the tea side, I mean, any any perspectives on technology? Are you, are you are you concerned about what's going on with technology? I mean, obviously, social media is part of that. Mm. Are, you, are you kind of excited about it and 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 positive about it? Um, both, really. So, I think, firstly, I'm I'm really really excited because I think what technology has done so so clearly, and I think will continue to do even more so, is just take crap away that's in our lives. I think you shouldn't have done a beautiful job of that. You know, if I just go back to bookkeeping for my business and I rewind the clock, you know, 15 years, oh, the 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 the, the paperwork, the Excel sheets, then now with, you know, the, the platforms that we use, with everything being completely web-enabled, picture done, a couple of digits in, and that's all done. So it's allowed, it's taken away a lot of mundane work. And I think it will continue to take away that mundane work, the bu- unnecessary bureaucracy. So it stops us wasting time where we can't really affect stuff that matters. So I love, absolutely love and embrace technology for the role it's done there. I also love, I think, how the potential it has for solving problems with much greater speed a much greater consistency than humans ever could, right? And, ac- and accuracy at, at the same time. So I think about, you know, the, the promise of artificial intelligence and the promise of super intelligence and what it's going to bring us. Not what it's going to bring us, what it is doing right now and the number of organizations of what they're doing and how the stuff is playing out is really quite amazing. And, you know, my business partner is working with a health tech startup and they're focused on inflammatory diseases. And so whereas in the past, you know, so my mother suffers from Crohn's and colitis. It's a horrible inflammatory bowel condition. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. And uh, and so, you know, she, it was undiagnosed for 30 years and then she suffered with uh, steroids and then she had a stoma with her bowel, colon being taken out, horrible stuff. Now, if you can, what this business is doing, they're starting off with Crohn's and colitis, is how do we help people who've been diagnosed manage their symptoms and just be on top of it in a, in a proactive, self-managed way. So, you know, they've got um, control limits when you're trending out, or then a doctor will need to give you a shout and say, you know, let's bring this back under control, reduce the amount of usage of drugs. What other things can you do preventative, whether it's around your sleep patterns, whether it's your diet. So I'm loving how technology can help people with much greater speed, consistency, and accuracy than we would have ever been able to just as human beings. So, so I love that. I think 
I also love the choice technology brings. You know, I, I go back to when I was a kid, everyone fighting over the TV. There were three channels, right? BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV, and that was it. <laughs> that was it, and it was a fight. Well, you know, now you can stream whatever you want, wherever you want. You I, thought know, you gonna, I, thought, reality. I, I thought you were going to say you, you were fighting over the, over the joystick to play... You know, remember that Donkey that, Kong. You know, Donkey you know, Kong. No, oh, Donkey Kong. I was going to say that maybe even even further back, the kind of like the, the you remember the tennis game you could play on on the mm. screen. Blip, blip. <laughs> That's the one. Now, 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 now I can't get Ben and James off the Xbox or YouTube, but you know, apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> Absolutely, that's amazing. But the, the stuff that concerns me about tech, I mean, there's the obvious stuff around jobs are going away, but you know, I think that's more a case of people reskilling to take those new jobs that are going to be created because I think that you know for sure there is going to be different jobs and new jobs and I think that's just the evolution but that's the part of that that worries me the most though is the people and the countries and the um, groups of people that just don't have access to good education to be able to upskill that's that's you know a concern is it going to just further divide us from a social economic perspective just because of access to education to be able to but that's also getting better i think the other piece that's concerning is what i referred to earlier on is just about how we connected and i love the idea of how these platforms are allowed us to connect with so many people that we would never have been able to connect to because it's so darn easy i think about all of my mates from school i've now connected with on facebook and i, lo- I absolutely love that um the, 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 but then also what I also see is the way the younger generations are le- communicating is purely from a technology perspective. You know, pick up the phone. Oh, that would be weird. You know, let's go and see them. Oh, you know, it, and so much gets lost in translation, right? When it's purely type text or even then abbreviated text. So that concerns me just in terms of how we, we as human race stay connected as human beings beyond just a short text or pure content driven way and i think the other thing that concerns me is and and it's really come out this last couple of years is just what you know is right or wrong how do you know truth from falsehood you know whether it's around manipulated videos whether it's around um these bots that push out messages on social media so how do you distinguish reality from fake uh, whether it's video, whether it's content, whether it's organizations. And I think more we can help or more we ourselves question what we're looking at and try to take a broader perspective to not reinforce our own biases. I think that's going to help, but it's a tough one because behavior is a hard thing to change. So that's kind of my take on tech. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that's... Um... Yeah, there's, there's definitely some tech for good. It's, I think it's the thing about keeping the oversight on it and to making sure that it doesn't run away with itself. And, um, mm. you know, what is it? Rise of the machines. You know, it's, we've all seen the movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's, quite, it's, it's, it's a bit scary, those movies, actually, when you look at the movies, you go, is that, did they actually, do, when did they record that? You know, when did they make that movie? It's like, whoa. I'll tell you the two that really freaked me out recently is um, Back to the Future 3, I think it is when uh, Biff is like this superpower, right? And he runs the world. And I won't make a mention of anyone that kind of is very consistent with. Um, and <laughs> there was um, that film a few years ago, Contagion, right? About that global virus and how that panned out. That was really interesting to watch again. So, uh, Well, the, con- the Contagion one looks like a complete playbook, doesn't it? It's like you take the script and you just basically send yeah. it to all the different countries, including, you know, you know where. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's scarily, scarily uh, analogous, exactly. Yeah, so, well, let's just hope Blade Runner doesn't turn out to be true. Or Lord of the Rings. Let's <laughs> we'll have something more <laughs> heartfelt to be our future. I don't, I don't, I don't mind, you know, dressing like uh, Harrison Ford, you know, like with, with the, the, you know, the, the tight suits and the, the guns. They're quite good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I suppose, I mean, to to, to, to kind of, finish off uh, oh, a couple of things I suppose to finish off um, today's episode was I suppose one of the things that that um, I wanted to ask you was uh, you know given your your journey and it sounds like you've, mm. you've you've got some really good insights and you've got you got some real clarity on on your learnings was people that are listening to this episode that are saying you know they'd like to you know what are your takeaways what you know what would be the kind of the pearls of wisdom from the Rafster DJ DJ Rafster 
uh, for, t- for today's episode. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, okay, so... Actually, let me give you first a bit of wisdom from Raval Navikant rather than me. <clears throat> Embrace yourself. You know, I, I think that's super important because no one can copy you. Just become the best version of yourself. Focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. You'll get incremental gains by focusing on your weaknesses, but you'll get exponential gains by focusing on your strengths. So just embrace who you are because and no one's perfect and no one can be you. So that's, that's one. Um, secondly, I would say is actually picking up what you just said, embrace technology. You know, it's not going away, and but find a way that it can serve you and how the, and make the world a better place for us all, not just humans, I mean, the planet at all. But I think, you know, I, I, I do know of a number of close contacts that are still very anti-technology and you just can't, it's not going away. So brace it and figure out how it can help you get to where you want to get to and help you make the world that you want to make. I'd say the other piece is, actually, this is something that Jean-Luc, who was my boss at GE, said to me oh Jean-Luc quite the, a pivotal the, moment. the chief the chief HR officer yeah 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 Jean-Luc Augustine an absolute yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. Of a guy yeah he's a brilliant guy brilliant guy and and uh, he I was having a conversation about you know career choices I was in my early 20s at that point I don't what to do and he said look Ravi let me make this really simple for you I said great so he drew three circles it was a Venn diagram he said circle one what you are really good at and not and it's you're good at it because people tell you you're good at so okay circle t what do you love doing what do you get lost and therefore it doesn't feel like work okay and then there's an intersection point there and then circle three what is the problem in the world that needs solving and he said find that middle spot between those three circles what, what you're good at because people tell you you're good at it what you get lost in it because you just enjoy it, it feels right. And then where is there a problem in the world that needs solving it? And how do you pull the other two and overlay that? And that's your sweet spot. And you're not going to get it straight away. Hey, it took me 49 years before I figured it out. But keep exploring and try to find the intersection of those three circles. Wow. I'm going to say, Nick Ravan Navika. I nicked Ravad, I nicked Ravad Navikant, and I nicked Jean Luc Augustine. <laughs> yeah, but brought to you live from the Rafster. So, you know, you, it's, you, you, curated, you curated those inputs, yeah, to share with the world. That's fantastic. Absolutely. No, really, really good. Really good. Really good. Really, cool. sim- really simple, but also really good to, for people to remember and, and also to apply into what they're, you know, where they are in their journey. So, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, and I appreciate the time. And it's a nice banter, Andrew. It's been so long. Well, you know, we did it. Never say never. <laughs> I tracked you so, down. You tracked yeah. the rafter down. You see, <laughs> you did. Well, well, you, you know, you'll be doing online DJ sets next. Uh, I, I, so I tell you, what, I'm really quite lucky. My neighbour is a professional DJ, an ex-professional DJ. So he he hit the Ibiza crowds for many many years. And it was him who said, right, you need to get yourself one of those tractor, you know, wheels of steel. And, uh, yeah, he's slowly... I thought you were going to say, you, you say he, he told you to get the picture on the, on the wall behind you. It says old school. You know what? That was from a second-hand shop in Birmingham. Yeah. From, uh, Digbeth. I loved it. Because I think, it, well, I, I, I'm still stuck in my 70s and 80s disco, so... Kind of, I can just see. Of, I can just see you in the flowery shirts and the the big the big <laughs> pants. <laughs> so, in, so, so in terms of in terms of actually anybody that wants to learn more about the Rafster, about your obviously yeah. DJing skills and obviously your, your other superpowers, <laughs> what what's the best way of getting hold of you and, and uh, more about your what you do in the business side? I'm on LinkedIn, so it's uh, Ravi Ryan at four points, and I'm also on Twitter. So they're the two places I kind of. Sh- share my thoughts um linkedin a little bit more uh formal but twitter yeah just a few things that will come to mind I'll, I'll throw them out there so be happy to connect with people that are wanting to learn a little bit more about businesses being a force for good because they truly can be and are let's just get the word out there <laughs>
So I, I'm looking forward to seeing those hashtags. This is the Rafster, the Rafster. I mean, you know, you've, got to, you've got to own it. You've got to own it, right? <laughs> well, I've got hashtag good business talking. Is that a start? No, no, I think it's not. It's not nouveau riche again. It's, it's, it's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be more kind of trendy, you know. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. I'll, let me hone my skills because it's too painful for anyone else to listen to my my mixing yet. So uh, when I get to a point, it's even audible for someone else. I might is just that, take you. Is on. that when all the cats and dogs come out the back door? You got it. Screech exactly. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> They're asking, please shut up. Please switch it off. Please take the electricity out. <laughs> but, 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 but it's interesting though. I, I, what I didn't realise as a side thing with doing my mixing is actually it's incredibly therapeutic. Because I, what I did not realize is just how much mental attention DJing takes. I thought it was just, you know, a bit of a fun, you know, put a few, but no, you know, to get the beats on, to find the right place of that track, to mix with that track and make it, it it's proper mental focus. So what you, a wonderful way to turn your brain off from work. That's good. You, you, you've got the bins for it. You, you've got the bins on your head, you know, for people, <laughs> But people listen to this on Apple and Google and Spotify. You can't see that. And obviously, you know, he's got that. He's got the long flowing locks and the good looks. You know, <laughs> he'll be. He'll be. You know, once this, once the lockdown happens, he'll be straight to Ibiza. Hey, it won't come soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. That was Ravi Ray, who's the managing partner CEO of Four Points, um, and. Thank you for the thank you for the episode. And that was Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GNT Sessions podcast. Catch you later. Cheers.